Bom dia a todos e a todas. Hoje a gente recebe o Ricardo Martinez Garcia, que está atualmente no Instituto de Física Teórica da Unesp e no ICTP da América do Sul. É, os dois ficam no mesmo prédio lá em São Paulo. Né? O Ricardo é, é da Espanha, ele fez a graduação na Universidade de La Lagunha, depois o doutorado nas Ilhas Baleares, o mestrado e o doutorado, defendeu o doutorado em 2014 em física, e depois ele passou cinco anos é, em Princeton, nos Estados Unidos, fazendo pós-doc, e aí ele estava contando aqui que é aí que ele veio para essa parte mais de ecologia. Né? Ele, é, ele é membro afiliado da Academia Brasileira de Ciências, começou esse ano, é professor associado do ICTP de Trieste e é, tem auxílio do Instituto Serra Pileira. Então, hoje ele vai falar para a gente sobre é, uma incursão da física na ecologia, bom, estou traduzindo aqui livremente o, o, o título, é, modelando a dinâmica de vegetação em ecossistemas com quantidade de água limitada. Ele pediu para falar, acho que ele vai falar em inglês, porque ele está aqui no Brasil há um ano e meio, mas a maior parte do tempo na pandemia, né? acho que não tem problema, mas ele entende português, então se quiserem fazer perguntas em português. Ricardo, é um prazer recebê-lo aqui. Obrigada por ter aceito o convite. Agora é com você. Perfeito. Obrigado, Carlos. Muito obrigado pelo convite e pela apresentação. Então, sim, eu vou mudar agora para o inglês, porque para fazer a apresentação é, fica mais fácil para mim, mas vocês podem fazer perguntas no idioma que vocês é, quiserem, tá bom? So, yeah, thank you again for, for the invitation. It's uh, really great to be, to be here and to share part of the work that we are, we are doing here in São Paulo with, with all of you today. So my presentation is, uh, is very interdisciplinary as the work that we do, but I, I will put most of my focus on the theoretical part, on the physics that is behind uh, the models we do, so you can also find uh, these, these connections. So a question that uh, many times I, I get, or we people working more in this frontier between physics and, and ecology get when we uh, say that we are doing that is, is is why, I mean, why physics and, and ecology? So what is, uh, what is uh, that they share that makes ecology um, interesting for physicists and physics useful for ecologists? And, and I think this is a very fair question because um, the idea that most of us have about ecology is more related to natural history, which is actually how, how it started. So with this kind of, 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 of people from the late, uh, 19th century that were going to the field and they were counting uh, animals, counting, counting plants and describing them on a way uh, that is very far away from, from what we are used as physicists. So in a more uh, outreach way than on an academic way. So it's very hard often and sometimes to make this connection between a science that is so descriptive and so qualitative and a science that is much more formal and more, much more quantitative as, as, physics, as physics is. But uh, when, when people started studying these systems just by observing them and describing them, they soon, very, very soon actually, they realized that actually uh, understanding an ecological pattern, understanding, for instance, a distribution of plants on a system or understanding how the number of butterflies in your backyard changes with time uh, is pretty much the same as understanding a dynamical process. And I want to give you some examples to, to support this, this statement that I'm making. Um, the first one is, for instance, uh, this curve, that, or this, this time series that you can see in, in your screen now, where you can see um, the amount of, of yeast. So yeast is a unicellular organisms, organism that is very useful because it's responsible for many nice goods as bread, beer, wine. And you can see the amount of yeast in a, in a growth solution, in a liquid, in a bottle, as a function of time. So basically this is an experiment where people took a, a bottle with liquid and some food for yeast, and they allow it to grow and they monitor the amount of, of, of cells that they saw in that, in that bottle. And what they found is that this, um, this curve, basically it grew for some time, for the first, let's say 30 hours, more or less. And then eventually it stopped growing and it saturated at a fixed level. Uh, of course, this is probably one of the simplest uh, space, uh, temporal patterns that we can see in ecology. There are others that are way more, 
more complex, more complicated, also more interesting. And the one that you see here is uh, a time series for several years, much, a much longer time scale, uh, where uh, people track the population size of, of two species, of two species uh, that they interact with each, with each other in a way that one, in this case, lynxes are the predator of the other. So basically, hares serve as food for lynx. So as you can see, when we have now these two different uh, types of, of animals uh, coming into play and interacting with each other, the pattern is now much more, uh, much more interesting because we have, for instance, these uh, nice uh, noisy oscillations in population abundance that are telling us that when one of the population gets very big, it favors the growth of the, growth of the other because the other has a lot of food. So then it starts taking over, but at some point they ate a lot. So the population that is the resource, the food, declines, the other one declines a little bit after, and so on and so forth. So uh, these are just two examples of, of the patterns that we can, um, we can study in, in ecology, uh, but there is um, a common ingredient behind many of these uh, systems and many of these patterns that made it very, very appealing for physicists, and, and especially for a subset of, of physicists. And it is the the fact that the uh, macroscopic patterns that we observe, this, this population time series and other patterns that I will show you later, uh, they are kind of independent of the microscopic details that create them. And what I mean by that is that, uh, for instance, in, in this case of, of, the, of the yeast that was growing on, on, on some nutrients, it, it really doesn't matter um, the specific yeast that we have or even the specific organism that we have. Of course, the time scale will change, the population size will change, the scales will change, but the qualitative shape of the pattern that I described before, um, represented by this initial growth and the subsequent saturation of the growth, is robust against those details. So there is examples of many systems, many organisms that follow this same kind of saturating growth. And this is an idea that somehow reminds us to the, 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 the basic principles behind statistical mechanics in which the microscopic details of the system don't really matter too much to get an accurate description of the macroscopic observables of, of that system that we are studying. And that connection kind of clicked in the, in the mind of, of, of many researchers, many mathematicians, many physicists that started getting interested in understanding these more uh, biological patterns rather than the more classical physics systems that they were working on. Um, this happened more or less in the beginning of the 20th century. And of course, the first tries to, to describe these uh, ecological systems quantitatively were the simplest ones. And maybe now most of them still remind as, as like the, 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 the key models in ecology. Others have been challenged, of course. This is how things move forward. But I think it's, it's still interesting to, to discuss them and to gain intuition about uh, more, um, I don't know if complex, but more uh, modern things that we are, we are doing right now, but they, they still rely on these uh, classical principles. So I want to uh, keep using this, this example of the gist that I, I, I discussed in the beginning. And, and basically, this was one of the very first uh, mathematical approaches to study uh, an ecological pattern. And basically, what, um, what, what mathematicians started uh, thinking is that this time series, of course, it's a dynamical system. They can describe it with an ordinary differential equation. And, and they, uh, in a very phenomenological way, actually, now we, we kind of have uh, the microscopic uh, processes that are behind this, this ODE description, but they, in, 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 the, first, in the very first um, approach, they, they just wrote the equation and they saw that they, it, it was uh, representing very nicely this curve. They, um, they elaborated this model in which they basically say that the, the change in the population size with time, so this time derivative here on the left side, uh, has two components. So the first one is, is a, an exponential growth, so basically it's this uh, R times N, um, uh, term that is basically um, responsible for the growth of the population when n is very small. So basically when n is small we can uh, neglect this term and what we have is a kind of uh, fast exponential growth that you can see either in this 
solution of this equation or in the experimental data. However, they, 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 they also saw that when the population size gets very crowded, when the population gets very crowded, uh, somehow there need, we need to have some nonlinear terms, some interaction between these cells that stops the growth. And that's what is represented by uh, this quadratic term here. So basically there are two regimes when the population size is very small, exponential growth dominates, and when the population size is large, this kind of uh, quadratic saturation stops the growth. Of course, what is key is that this qualitative description is accurate for many different systems, but if we want to quantitatively uh, fit this uh, model to, to a specific system, then we will need to measure and we'll, or we will need to get estimations of the parameters of the model that in this case are R and D. I mean, I'm not going to go into so much detail for the other case that I showed you, but I still want to to, 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 to make the point that these oscillations can also be represented in this case by a system of ODEs, ordinary differential equations, one for, uh, one for each of the populations, and that depending on the parametrization of these equations, you can recover the oscillations that you see in the data and also the phase of the oscillations. So you see that the peaks of the uh, prey, in this case the red curve, anticipate the, pre the peaks of the predator as one can statistically measure in this curve. Of course, here there is a lot of noise because nature is noisy. That's one of the, of the take home messages that one um, gets when, starting, when, when, when they start working on, on ecology. But the um, coarse graining uh, or coarse details of, of, the, of the model, they are, still, they are still there. But as I said, this is a very uh, simple. These were the first attempts of, of people to, to understand nature using mathematics and using uh, some physics, uh, some physical principles. And the, the overall idea that comes out from these results, and, and that is the idea that we are working on here in Sao Paulo, is that um, these individual behaviors or, or the processes that happen at the level of the individual, in the case I showed you, are cell division for the case of yeast. Yeast just split their cells when they have food. In the case of these prey and predators, it's one animal eating the other, or in maybe many other different behaviors, as we will see now in, in the rest of the talk. So they interact with each other, individuals interact with each other and they respond to these interactions by behaving in a, in a, in a different way. And they also interact with the environment. Those interactions affect either the reproduction of the organisms, they may also affect the movement. If, I don't know, you respond by slowing down to the presence of individuals around you or many other uh, type of interactions and they lead to the formation of, a, of an emergent pattern. That can be this time series, can be, uh, other spatial structures that we will see now in a while. It's some emergent property that is resulting due to the existence of those interactions. And eventually by studying that emergent property, we can learn ecology about the system. So this is kind of the uh, a schematic way of thinking when one approaches this uh, macroscopic or this emergent phenomena in ecology using uh, mathematical tools, or at least is the one um, that we, we follow. So I want to move now a little bit from uh, time series and curves that are not so interesting to show you a little bit more of other systems we work with. Um, so for instance, one, sorry, one example of, of, of how these interactions may create patterns happens at a very, very small scale. Um, the movie that I'm about to show you is uh, a population of bacteria that they divide on a surface and, and they basically create what is called a biofilm, which is nothing else but a colony of cells. So what we did to do this experiment is we uh, took two cells or two lines of cells that were identical to each other. And the only difference is that one of them is blue and the other one is red, but they are identically otherwise. And what we do is we, try, we track the, the, um, the division of these cells by the color that they have. So what you see here is this growth process that at the end uh, results on a spatial pattern of red and blue cells on a surface that tells us a lot of things about how uh, cells allocate their uh, descendants and, and, and then we can study things related to the size of the group and how that impacts the, the ecology of the community and we can ask many interesting ecological questions to this, to this system. A different system where we 
uh, work that has a movie that to me is very, very uh, fascinating and I always like uh, showing it is um, slime molds. Uh, slime molds are very, very tiny amoeba. They are also single cells. And eventually when they don't have food, they start doing something that you are about to see and that I'm, I'm happy to, to, to discuss with you in more detail. So they start uh, communicating with each other. They start sending chemicals to each other and they follow the gradients of those chemicals and they create multicellular aggregates. So in this aggregation process, there is a lot of physics behind it because cells, uh, they not only sense and follow gradients, but they also form like spiral waves patterns, stream patterns. So it's a, a very, very rich uh, biological process in terms of the physics behind it. So this is very nice because they are tiny microbes that do very uh, fancy things, but we also work on larger scale systems. So for instance, this is a wild beast migration in, in Africa where you can see hundred, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of, of animals crossing the river and, and crossing and, and moving kilometers away. So we study how these animals uh, get to do this together without anyone saying we go. This is a non-centralized system. There is collective uh, decision making here. And, and, and we study how that uh, collective uh, behavior emerge out of these individual level interactions. But today, what I'm, I want to share with you is some work that we've been doing for quite a while, trying to understand how uh, semi-arid ecosystems behave and how using physics and mathematics, we can learn more about them. So why a physicist study a dryland ecosystem? Well, from a physics point of view, from a physicist point of view, is because when we gain the ability of observing the Earth from above, so I'm not even talking about satellites, just taking a camera from a couple of, of meters up and, and taking pictures of, of the land, we observe that uh, the vegetation in this system forms very, very nice and very, very striking and surprising regular patterns. So this pattern, for instance, here is, is in Israel, it's a grass, a grass, sorry. <clears throat> and you can see that the scale of the pattern is, is very small. It's very 10 centim centimeters, more or less. But these patterns form in many other different places and they have very different characteristic, characteristic time scales. So here, for instance, we are already in the order of, of, of 100 meters. The patterns have different shapes. They are in very different places. So this is a very nice uh, pattern in, in, in Australia. <clears throat> and also depending on the on the properties of the of the landscape, sometimes, for instance, if there is a, a symmetry breaking axis in the in the landscape, for instance, some slope, then the pattern takes these kind of bands following the or, or in, in perpendicular to to the slope. So there is a lot of uh, nice patterns out there in these dry ecosystems, and and it's very interesting to study them because plants don't move, uh, plants are way smaller than than the the size of the pattern. So how is, is this uh, large structure forming? And more interestingly, why is it important? So is it telling us something about the uh, ecosystem, about the, the how, how, how much can we learn about the place where these patterns form by looking into them? That's the question that we, we address. From a non, non, not only physicist point of view, but like a person point of view in general, uh, these ecosystems are very, very important. So they cover a very large part of the earth, about 40%, and uh, about a third, of, a third of, the, of the world population lives in one of these ecosystems. So it's, uh, it's not something that is, I don't know, in some place and we want to study this pattern because it's pretty, it's something that is in many different places and, and makes many people make, make their lives out of, out of the services that these ecosystems provide. Uh, besides that, most of these dry ecosystems are in, uh, in developing countries. So people really rely on the, on, on, on the nature of, of the place where they, they live in order to, to, to make their life. So it's, it's actually a, a thing. I mean, it's, it's, an, inter, it's an important uh, ecosystem to, to understand. Can I ask something? Sure. What is the white in this color? So the white is anything that is not a dry ecosystem. So for instance, okay. the Amazon okay. or some Arctic okay. ecosystem. So it's not part of this color scale? No, 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 sorry. No. So okay. 
Okay. Anything not white is a dryland, and anything white is something else. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, even here in Brazil, for instance, we have uh, a large part of, of the country that is, uh, is, a, is a dry ecosystem. It's in the Northeast, it's the Caatinga, and even within uh, the countries where these ecosystems are, uh, are observed, they usually are in the regions that have, uh, in the less wealth regions. Let's say. So in, in Brazil, for instance, they are in the Northeast, which is one of the regions that has more, uh, more like worse uh, developing indices, has less wealth. So it's really important to, to understand how these patterns, uh, sorry, how these ecosystems behave, both from an environmental point of view, from a sociological, socioeconomical point of view, and from, I would say, almost any, any point of view we can think of. So, okay, we have these patterns, we have these ecosystems, and we started uh, studying them. And, and there is a property that these patterns have that make them very, very interesting from an ecological point of view. And it is that, uh, these fancy shapes that I showed you that uh, some of, sometimes were some spots of vegetation, sometimes were more uh, like finger-like uh, labyrinths, they, they have a very strong correlation with the amount of water that the ecosystem has. So this is, um, these are results from, from a, a study done by the Blaue and, and collaborators in, in Sudan, in Africa. And, and basically what they found is that in regions where there is uh, less water, that is here, this, uh, this blue region here, the patterns are mostly uh, spots. In regions with intermediate precipitation, the, the shapes look more like uh, these labyrinths that you can see here. And in regions where there is a little bit more of water, the way vegetation arranges is by almost covering the whole space and just leaving some holes in the middle of, of, of the matrix of, of vegetation. So there are two interesting results from, from this study. The first one is that the shapes of the pattern can be classified in, in these three categories mostly, and this is something that is very general. Again, it does not depend very strongly on the species of plants. It does not depend very strongly on the type of soil. It basically depends on the amount of water that the system has, which of these three types of, of patterns we will get. So, okay, we kind of have now a, a, a broad ecological view or a broad motivation of the problem. And probably we are physicists. We are wondering where is physics coming into play here? And that's what I want to, to dedicate most of the rest of, of the talk to. So as I said, we have very broadly speaking these three main classes of patterns that I'm going to refer to them as spots because for instance, this one we have this basically bare soil and then spots of plants on, on top of it. Then we have this more uh, labyrinth, so this more intricate, intricate uh, shape. And finally, we have these, these gaps. So for those of you that are more familiar with uh, nonlinear dynamics and especially extended systems or chemi chem chemical systems, these patterns are very, very, very close to Turing patterns. So to patterns that uh, emerge from, 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 Turing, uh, from, from Turing models to, to study actually morphogenesis. So this, this model was motivated to, to try to understand the emergence of different pattern shapes in the skin of animals. So for instance, the zebra stripes or the, the leopard skin and, and fish, fish, fish skins as well. And the shape of the patterns, as you can see, are very, very similar to the ones we observe in, in vegetation. Also, in optical uh, cavities, we sometimes uh, observe light that forms patterns that are very similar to, to for instance, this spot one. So this uh, connection click again, something in the mind of many, many physicists. And actually, I have to say that most of the work that was done to study these vegetation patterns in the beginning was led by, I, have, I don't know if optical, or people coming from optics or people that were combining both things, but most of the first models were models that were developed to study this uh, emergence of, of patterns of light in optical cavities. And also some combination with, with uh, former Turing models. So for those of you that are less familiar with uh, this uh, Turing principle, which is going to be very, very uh, fundamental for, this, uh, for, for the next slides in this presentation, <clears throat> I want to give you a very brief summary. So basically, uh, Turing principle to, to explain the formation of these patterns 
rely on the interaction between two different substances, two different chemicals, let's say. One of them is called the activator, and basically it produces more, more of itself. It's kind of an autocatalytic substance, and it also produces, uh, enhances the production, production of a second chemical that we are going to call the inhibitor. At the same time, this inhibitor uh, blocks the production of the activate, activator, as you can see in this, in this scheme here. So what is really important for a Turing pattern to emerge or from a, for a Turing instability to emerge is that the diffusion, I mean, these two chemicals have to diffuse in space and the diffusion of the activator has to be much smaller than the diffusion of the inhibitor. So we can write that in, in a pair of coupled uh, PDEs where we basically have that the change in time of, of each of the substances depends on some reaction terms. So basically these are nonlinear functions that uh, recover these uh, interactions here. And they also depend on some spatial diffusion of, of, of the chemicals. <coughs> uh, very schematically, again, the, what, what happens with, with these dynamics, of course, F and G have to meet some properties, is that uh, eventually when we have some heterogeneities in the concentration of, of these chemicals, the concentration of the, uh, you know, in homogeneities in the concentration of the activator in enhance the emergence of these heterogeneities in the inhibitor as well. And because the inhibitor diffuses laterally much faster, it kind of uh, contains the growth of the activator to a given region. It diffuses very fast and it inhibits the creation of the activator and it kind of bounds the growth of the, of the activator leading to, to these kind of oscillations in 1D of the uh, chemical concentration. In 1D, there is a lot of theory to, know, to pattern formation that I'm not going to go into details uh, that basically explains how we can get this huge, rich variety of patterns out of these kind of, 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 of systems of equations. Now, this is just an example. You can find many of them in this very nice review paper by, by Kondo. And there is really a lot of, of different patterns that we can get, mostly depending on the nonlinearities that we introduce here. So how can we translate this to, to vegetation? Well, we can uh, consider our activator and inhibitor to be the vegetation and the water. Remember that we know that water is the key uh, environmental uh, parameter. If you want water availability, is the key environmental parameter driving these, these patterns. And we can basically write uh, this uh, set of PDEs for water and, and vegetation. So this would be making the connection with the previous equations that you saw. This would be the F function, this would be the G function, and this would be the diffusion terms. What is very interesting is that um, these differences in diffusions are actually a thing. So water usually spreads laterally much faster than how vegetation grows. I mean, um, something that I, I want to clarify here is that by diffusion of vegetation, I'm not meaning that uh, vegetation moves. It's, I mean, what we consider when we introduce this is that because of the uh, dispersion of seeds, the patches of vegetation grow. Um, and basically, the idea behind these equations is that when we have, let's say we have a tree, um, we have some uh, activation term that is given by this quadratic term. So basically what we are saying is that whenever we have a tree, uh, it, it enhances the, the infiltration of water. So having vegetation is better to have more vegetation. That's what this uh, quadratic term is telling us. So basically we have some conversion of water to vegetation. You see that this term is the same and this Q is just some conversion factor that doesn't have any dimension. It's not, it's not very important here. And we also have this, as I said, these differences in, in diffusions. All the rest of the terms are uh, for the water. We are assuming that we have some constant precipitations. And these are, is just an external parameter that we can, for instance, fix depending on the region where we are. Maybe, I don't know, 100 millimeters per year, 1,000 or whatever. It's an external parameter. This term that is coupled to this one, as I said, is the conversion of water to vegetation. And this, um, this term here is, telling, is, is uh, accounting for physical losses of water, for instance, uh, evaporation at a given rate L, and this is the diffusion. 
For the vegetation, it's pretty much the same. This term here is just modeling the death of plants that die at a constant rate n. Again, what is key about this model is, is this coupling between water and, and vegetation. What is the inhibitor and the activator in, the, in, yes. in this model here? So the activator is the, uh, is the vegetation. So the more vegetation we have, the more vegetation we create. And the inhibitor is the, is the water because lacking water inhibits the, uh, the growth of, of, of vegetation. So through this term here, if you set W to, to zero, you see that this term goes to zero and basically all plants die. So water is a limiting resource, is what in ecology call a limiting resource. And the lack of vegetation, the lack of water uh, inhibits the growth of, of vegetation. So if you want to, to, I mean, to me, it helps a lot to understand it in terms of uh, the spatial system. So basically, whenever I have a plant, it will increase the infiltration of water in that position. And because of the diffusion of, of water, it will move towards the new, towards the region where I have less water, right? Because it's, uh, it's infiltrating there and it will be dragged from here from regions where I don't have plants to regions where I have plants. And eventually you create, you create these patterns. So we can do a lot of things with these models. We can do some uh, analytical work to predict the existence of patterns. It's called a linear stability analysis. We can integrate it numerically to see how the patterns actually look like. And, and what these models reveal is something that is, is very interesting and has uh, motivated many, many years of research. So the, um, what, what people did when they, what people observed when they uh, studied this system is that when they look into the mean vegetation of biomass as a function of this R parameter, the amount of water, the, the amount, sorry, the mean vegetation biomass decreases with, with rainfall. However, when they uh, look into the actual shape of the pattern, they also observe that the shape of the pattern changes as the precipitation decreases, which is something that we knew from data. However, what they found that is especially interesting is that when, once the system reaches this spot pattern, the system collapses to a desert state in a abrupt transition. Abrupt transition that also has some hysteresis loop and that has, uh, which has very important ecological implications. For instance, if the system is in a desert state with some hysteresis, to recover vegetation, we actually need to increase the rainfall a lot. So this is one of the results from, from these models. Um, in, in my PhD, we, we started uh, thinking about alternatives to get these patterns because all this scale dependent feedback is very nice, but we don't have a strong empirical evidence of, of these mechanisms being related to patterns. This is something that is very hard to get. So we developed a much simple model that only has two ingredients, actually. The first one is death. This term is very similar to the one you saw before. And the other one is um, reproduction. So this is a kind of this uh, saturating growth that you saw in the, in the, back, in the GIST example, sorry. So basically for the growth, what we are assuming is that there is some seed production at a read beta. And then there is some limitation. This is, work, uh, this is written, sorry, in non-dimensional density. So that's why you have one, here one minus V. V goes from zero to one. And what is really key to, to understand our model is that what we uh, assume is that once a seed established in a place, in order for it to grow and, and give rise to an adult plant, it has to overcome competition with plants in a given neighborhood. So this is a kind of non-local model. The competition, between, sorry, a plant that is on a given location X, not only competes with plants in X, but also competes with plants in the neighborhood. And this is because plants have roots that have some finite extension on the space, and therefore there is some non-local interactions in this system. So this non-locality can be modeled through a, a convolution integral, as, as you can see here. And basically, we, we, we only need to impose a few conditions to, to this probability. The first one is, that the probability of overcoming competition, this PC of D or this R, if you wish, it has to decrease with the amount of vegetation. So the more plants I have, the less likely I, likely I am to, to survive. And the second condition is that when, um, sorry, we, we also need to, this probability of overcoming competition needs to depend also on, on some strength of the competition, which is basically the amount of water. You can think that 
If there is a lot of water, no one is going to fight with each other for water because everyone has. But if there is uh, less water, then they will fight a bit more. Water will be more competitive. It's more or less like research funding in, in, a, in the university system. So basically what we assume is that this probability of overcoming competition is equal to one when the competition is very weak, when there is water for everyone, everyone will um, compete, everyone will overcome this, this competition. But when the water is very scarce, the competition, the probability of overcoming the competition should tend to, to zero. Anyway, what is very uh, fundamental about this model or, or the take home message about this model is that because of this non-local, non-locality, these non-local interactions, whenever we have, again, some heterogeneities in a space in the distribution of vegetation that are growing, um, they lead to heterogeneities as well in the intensity of the competition. And more importantly, when we have two peaks of plants that I'm here representing by these two clusters, there will be a region in between them where the competition is very strong because if you want to establish there, you will have to fight with guys from one patch and guys from the other patch. Whereas if you are in one patch, you only compete with your patch mates. And that uh, heterogeneity in the strength of the competition is going to play the same role as this activation inhibition principle and is going to drive the emergence of the exact same patterns. So this, this result is interesting in two ways. First, we have a very new approach, a very new route to have these patterns. And second, because when we study the connection between these patterns and the uh, ecological transition to the certification that I showed you before, this model shows a very, very different transition. So now that's not abrupt anymore. We lost the hysteresis. We have a very smooth transition to a desert state that is very, very different in terms of managing this ecosystem, in terms of understanding how to restore this ecosystem, how to avoid uh, the loss of the functionality of drylands and in many other different ecological and environmental aspects. So this is the summarizing uh, take home message from this first part. Patterns, they are important, they are meaningful, they are helpful, but if, they, they, if we want to use them to predict how an ecosystem behaves, we should not be only satisfied with the, uh, with, with developing theory that reproduces the pattern itself, but we need to do it from the right interactions because having a spot pattern, for instance, is not very meaningful if I don't know if my system is, I mean, having a spot pattern is not a sign of my ecosystem to be following an abrupt transition. If the system is driven by a set of mechanisms, it might be, but if it is driven by another set of mechanisms, it might not be. So this is the, the motivation of the, of, the, of the last study that I want to, to show you that was actually uh, published last year. We, we get to that conclusion where we need a mechanisms. We need the, to know the mechanisms by which plants interact to understand these patterns. And in the big picture that I showed you in the beginning, basically we need to understand this top part very, very well. We cannot postulate mechanisms that don't have very strong empirical evidence. We cannot do that. We need to really understand what's going on. So maybe this connection between the microscopic details not mattering so much is not so uh, accurate now. So this is where, uh, at this time I, I was still in Princeton and I was um, at that time not working. I, I was um, having a lot of conversations with uh, Ciro Cabal, who was a grad, is a grad student there. And we started asking ourselves, how can we understand how these plants interact with the, with the, uh, between them underground? So this is the main question of his thesis actually. And just came out that I was also interested on this and, and he had a very interesting ideas. To, to try to do models on to, uh, to study this behavior. So again, the questions that were driving me were understanding these models of vegetation, formation, vegetation pattern formation, also learning things about interactions between plants below ground. They are very hard to understand because we don't see them. Basically, if you want to see how plants interact above ground, you can observe them, you have many tools, but below ground is not so easy. But besides that, there are many more profound ecological questions that were driving uh, mostly serious research, but that I also find very interesting that are, for instance, understanding better uh, below ground interactions. It's very helpful to design better cultivars. So plants have a finite amount of energy and they have to decide if they put it into the roots or into the leaves, basically, or into the seeds or into the up, up, up ground part. If 
we understand how they uh, make those decisions, we can uh, grow the cultivars, we can breed uh, things in a way that they minimize the investment in, in, in roots and they maximize the investment in, in food, basically. And, and another important ingredient is that roots accumulate a lot of carbon in these ecosystems and they are very, very important actors in very uh, larger scale ecological processes. So understanding how roots behave is very important to develop models that uh, study climate change and global change in a much more informed way. So as you can see, these are the questions that a physicist has when they study um, uh, one of these questions. And these are the questions that an ecologist usually have much more um, I don't know if broad or, but definitely very interesting as well. Anyway, um, we were of course not the first ones uh, addressing this question. There was people studying this before, and there are two ways of studying this problem. One is what we call the spatial approach that does not look into the amount of roots. It, it only tries to map the places where a plant, a plant puts roots without uh, taking into account how many or the density, no, they just try to map the root systems. So what you can see here is um, an experimental site where these two persons here, these two people here, Bryson and Rhinos, they, um, they, 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 they looked into the root systems of very different plants and they interpolated them by using polygons and following that, they calculated the overlap region between these polygons. So they wanted to see how much overlap between root systems one can find. And what they found is that when they compare their experimental results here in this uh, panel with random experiments that they uh, computationally run using the, the area of, of these same polygons, so basically taking these polygons and throwing them randomly, as you can see by the comparison of the gray areas in these two panels, they found that in nature, we have way less overlap than what one should expect from a random uh, process, a random distribution. So this is the conclusion of this spatial approach. Then there is another one that we call the biomass approach or the economy approach that doesn't look into space and they only look into mass of roots. So they don't care where the roots are, they only care how much roots a plant makes. So a very uh, important study in this approach was this one by Gersani and, and their collaborators where they did modeling and experiments. But their main conclusion was that when plants grow sharing a space, so if you put two plants together in a pot, they produce more roots than what they do when they grow on their own uh, space without sharing it. That's represented by the different heights of these two columns here. You see the dash one representing sharing the space and the other one representing owning their own space. But this result is a little bit controversial in the sense that uh, later studies um, found the opposite trend. So this is another study from 2015, where they found that when plants own their own space, they produce more roots than what they do when they share the space. So there was no, no agreement here, here at all. So as you see, there are two different approaches, not a lot of consensus, and what we, did was to try of kind of combine these two approaches and we develop a spatial model that the that describes the growth of the root biomass so basically a biomass spatial approach our model is quite simple i know if this will disappoint some of you but it's very very simple but still very powerful to do biological predictions and that's one of the messages that i want to throw also with this presentation so we have very few processes the first one is that resources come let's say water, for instance. This is similar to this R parameter that I showed you before. The second one is that resources are lost as well because of, for instance, evaporation or infiltration below roots or many other mechanisms that you may think. The third one is again, this interaction between resources and, and, and roots, so intake. And the fourth one, which is the, that is the one that makes our model uh, especially explicit, is that we, account for the fact that when a plant want to, wants to take resources from a given soil location, let's say for instance, here at a distance X from their uh, stem, they need to pay a cost that depends on the distance at which they want to exploit because they have to create a root and then the larger the root is, the more energy it requires basically. Using um, fluid, mecha fluid mechanics and biophysical arguments, we, we, we use that cost to be uh, proportional to the square of the length, but that's, um, I mean, we run sensitivity analysis to this and that's not very important. 
And basically putting together these mechanisms, these, these processes, this is the pair of equations that we are going to work with. So this is the resource dynamics is very similar to the one I showed you before. Notice that now we don't even have diffusion because we are working with very small uh, systems. And then for the plants, um, we write an equation that is telling us the, the feed, what, what is called the fitness of the plant, that is nothing else but the reproduction rate. So how good it is at reproducing. It's very intuitive to see that this um, fitness or this reproduction is a balanced equation between the benefit that the plants take for, from taking these resources and the cost that it pays for obtaining these benefits. Nothing else but a balanced equation. So because the math is quite simple, um, we, I mean, we can go um, quickly through it. Basically, this model is already simple, but there is something else in this system that allow us to simplify it, simplify it even more and is the fact that the dynamics of the resource is much faster than the dynamics of the plant. So we can basically assume that the water is always at equilibrium. We can obtain that value of the density of water in the equilibrium. We can plug it in the equation for the fitness and we can get a one equation and a closed description for the growth rate or the fitness of the plant. Then the question is, what is the distribution of roots that maximizes that growth rate? What's the optimal allocation of roots for a plant? You do that imposing the typical maximization conditions and what we obtain is this kind of bell-shaped curve. I think it's nothing very uh, counterintuitive. I mean, the plant puts more roots close to, to its stem and less roots far away from it. The interesting thing comes when one considers two plants. And in this case, we have two plants, the orange and the yellow that are at a given distance from each other. The model can be extended very easily to this scenario. The only thing that we need to consider is that now, of course, this intake of resources at a given location X depends on the total amount of roots, R1 plus R2. And then, of course, we need to write two equations, one for the growth rate of plant one and the other one for the growth rate of plant two, but all the else is the same. What is really important here is that the cost of the plant two depends on the distance I mean, in the cost of the plant two, we need to account for this displacement in the insertion point. So basically, whenever we, for instance, if the plant wants to, if the plants wants to take food from, from this soil location here, for the orange plant is at a distance X, but for the yellow plant is at a distance X plus D. So we need to account for this because that's going to be key for, for the maximization, that optimization that we are going to, to perform. Anyway, doing again this time scale separation uh, and setting the dynamics of the water to zero, we get close expressions for the uh, fitness generating function of both plants for the growth rate of those plants. And now the optimization is not so straightforward because now we have different hypotheses here. For instance, we can assume that plants cooperate, that plants help, help each other. They kind of say, okay, here it's cheaper for you to take the water, so you take all the water. But whenever it's cheaper for you, for me, I take it all. So they kind of cooperate. But there is another hypothesis that is that they are not so nice to each other. They are more like uh, humans, I'd say. And they say, no, 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 this is uh, open space. Whoever gets what it takes, takes, takes it. So a more competitive optimization. That mathematically, that leads to different uh, optimization conditions. In the first one, we need to do a global optimization of the total fitness, that is basically the sum of the fitness of two plants. Whereas in the other case, we need to optimize the fitness function of each of the plants separately. So each of them optimizes its, its own and they don't care about the other. So all this is still analytically, I'm not analytical, I'm not, I'm not going to show the results because I like very long uh, equations, you can see them in, in, in the paper, uh, but the, the the interesting thing is the results that they give, and it's that they give very different distributions. The cooperative one basically tells us that they split perfectly. So, as I said, if here, for, so here I'm showing you three, three plants, the orange and the yellow one are showing this cooperative solution. You can see that they don't overlap at all. There is like a sharp uh, separation between the roots. And the, the blue one is the expectation for a solitary plant, just so you can compare what, what's happening when we have a second individual. So for instance, the, the, the blue solution you can see uh, would take this shape here. And when we have two plants, the red one 
of the orange one, despite being in the same location that the blue one was, it stops its root system here. So it basically retracts from the places that are closer to the yellow one because it's very nicely giving up resources to, to her there. The second hypothesis is very different and much more uh, complex, still not too much. And basically what, what tells us, again, this is the same comparison between solitary and, and competing plants. What it's telling us is that, yes, plants, when they compete, they still retract. They still give up a little bit to the other, but they become much more aggressive close to their uh, stem because there is very cheap for them to exploit and they kind of become aggressive and they defend what it's hers. So two predictions from our model that come from two different hypotheses. And the question is, which one is the right one? And this is, uh, I mean, of, to, to test which one is the right one, we did some experiments. I'm going to go through them very quickly also because I think I'm, I'm, I'm going very, uh, I was going very slow in the beginning. So the experiment that we did basically was, uh, we did them in Spain, we took peppers and we grow them, we grew them in a greenhouse. So you can see here the tiny peppers growing very happily because they have a lot of light and a lot of food. And eventually we planted them in a way that reminds the experiment that I was showing you before by Gersani. So basically we grew some pairs of plants that share space and other plants that own their own. We make sure that the distance, you can see here, the distance above ground is the same. So the competition for light is the same in both cases. The only difference is how they compete for soil resources. When they grow uh, to adult size, we cut them. And what we did that allow us to reconstruct the, um, the root systems of the plants is to insert ink on the root systems. So we put some pipes on the plants, we put a lot of pressure and we put red and blue ink and the ink percolated through the roots of the plants. And basically all this huge mass of roots that one hardly knows which, which root is from which plant, now we can because one are red and the other one are blue. So basically with that, we kind of did the same as uh, archeologists did in Jurassic Park, for instance, when they were reconstructed the dinosaur skeletons. And I, I don't know, I love that when I was a kid. So we have a, a special skeleton of the roots and we can recover the curves that we had theoretically in our experiment. So there is hypothesis one, hypothesis two, which one is going on? What we found is that hypothesis two is supported very, very strongly by our experiment. So of course, here the curves are parametrized, so they also quantitatively agree. This is something I assume we all do when we uh, show our results with experiments, but quantitatively the agreement is broad and is strong through the whole parameter space. That's the important, this, the important thing here. So in the experimental curve, again, more noisier as in the case of the prey predator that I was showing you, but the results are pretty much the same. The competing plants retract as compared to the solitary one and they become much more aggressive on the, on the local, on the close to, close to them. So yeah, this is the summary of, of the three ingredients of the three main conclusions of this, of this work. It's true when plants grow with competitors, they become they, they create shorter root systems. This is what the spatial approach was finding. Far away from their stems, they retract. And close away, close from their stems, they become more aggressive. So the last slide that I want to, or the last two slides that I want to show are trying to break that controversy that I was bringing in the beginning about the economic or the biomass approach. Remember that some people found that the plants produce more roots when they grow with, with uh, competitors. Others found that they produce fewer roots. So we wanted to know which one was the correct one. To do that, the nice thing is that with our model, we can uh, play with the distance between plants and we can get the predictions for the root systems as plants move away from each other. That's what I'm showing you in this movie. The model prediction for the spatial distribution of roots as I move apart the yellow and the orange plant. As you can see, eventually the orange, of course, collapses to the, to the yellow because uh, they don't see, they don't feel each other. Good. So what we can do with, um, with this is we can integrate the spatial distribution of roots and we will obtain the total biomass of, of, of roots produced by that plant. And we can obtain that as a function of the distance between plants. And that's what I'm showing you here. This is nothing else 
in the y-axis, but the integral of, of this curve, so the total amount of mass that we have, as a function of the distance between plants. The blue line is the root produced, the amount of roots produced by a solitary plant. That's why it doesn't change, it's always the same. It's the integral of the blue curve. And what we observe is that the amount of roots that a plant produces when it's growing with competitors depends on the distance between plants. So when plants are very close to each other, they overproduce overall roots. They produce more roots than when they are growing alone. This is Gersani's result. But when they are far away, they produce fewer roots. This is a chance result. So none of them was wrong. Both of them are correct. They were just looking into a very, into a point within a one dimensional parameter space, if you wish. So this is the summary uh, of, 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 of this study. The main conclusion is that when plants grow on shared resources, they don't help each other. They are very similar to humans. They, own, they look for their own benefit. And the main uh, properties of that behavior is that they shrink their root systems, they reduce their overlap, they become more territorial, they defend their territory. And close to them, they produce more roots than when they are alone and far away they produce fewer roots and the total biomass production depends on the distance between them. So I'm just here enumerating a few things that we are doing now in case you are, I don't know, have curiosity, I want to ask. And these are the two papers where you can read about this. This was published last year and this was published this year. This is more about results. This is more about uh, next steps and discussion and, and more hand-waving things. And yeah, this is the, all the people involved in, in this work, the people involved in the first part, my PhD advisors and postdoc advisors, and people involved in the last part who are friends as well, but not advisors. And this is the people that supported the research and. And thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any, any question. Muito interessante, Ricardo. Obrigada. Obrigado. Vou convidar o pessoal a ligar o microfone para a gente agradecer você. Eu acho que a gente pode mudar para o português, não? Sim, não? perfeito. Perfeito. É o mesmo que eu falar em inglês também. Português é perfeito. <risos> Beleza. Já tem algumas perguntas no chat, se você ah. quiser dar uma olhada, não sei se você tem acesso aí. Sim, eu acho é, que Eu vou convidar, na verdade, a primeira pergunta é do Dickman, se ele quiser fazer a pergunta. Oh, obrigado. Uh, foi um seminário fascinante. Eu não sabia que, que tem uh, investigações tão uh, quantitativas uh, desses fenômenos. Legal. A, a pergunta que eu tive é, é muito simples. Você mostrou uh, alguns uh, padrões de vegetação uh, no campo e a gente vê ex exatamente padrões que lembram de uh, uh, padrões de, de Turing. Uh, mas o que acontece se, se as condições uh, de umidade, etc., não estão mudando, mas ao longo dos meses, dos anos, esses padrões uh, evoluem ou, ou ficam mais ou menos estáticos? É, é, sim, essa é a pergunta quase chave de tudo isso. Eu mostrei esse, esse gradiente de, de precipitação, não? que tem a correlação entre a, a, as a propriedades de umidade a, a forma do padrão, mas para um lugar específico, a gente traquear, né? é seguir, acompanhar a mudança no padrão, é, ela acontece em uma escala temporal tão longa que não tem dados sobre isso. Então, o que, o que a gente tem, por exemplo, em lugares onde tem uma estação úmida, uma estação é, mais seca, aí tem é, mudanças, no, mas são mudanças que não são no, na forma do padrão, são no, como mais verde e menos verde, né? mais vegetação e menos vegetação, mas a forma do padrão é a mesma. É, tem outros exemplos de como as intervenções dos, dos humanos mudam a forma do padrão, porque ela acontece mais rápido, mas acompanhar no tempo, por exemplo, como é que se essa região verdadeiramente ela é, volta mais seca no tempo, mas as propriedades, tudo demais é o mesmo, 
¿Cómo el padrón realmente va a cambiar siguiendo esa, ese, ese gradiente que, que, que a gente acha? No tem dado para isso, porque acho que vai acontecer uma escala temporal tão longa que até agora não, não sabemos. Tá bom, obrigado. Obrigado, Elka. É... Você... Eu posso ler as perguntas? É, Pode, uma... a Carla, se ela quiser. Fazer ah, as perfeito. Acho que ela está aí. Ah, bom, né? Obrigado pelo seminário, bem interessante, Ricardo. E, na verdade, aí são, são duas perguntas. A primeira é a influência do vento, né? porque vocês analisaram, né? a, a, parece que raízes e, e os padrões, mas se o vento não tem né, a ver com isso. E depois, quando você compara com né, as, as plantas em geral, assim, né, tem algumas que não gostam de ficar juntas, né? Então, você não pode colocar juntas. Então, não sei se o tipo de planta teria alguma influência e isso acaba influenciando o tipo de planta que aparece nesses locais também, não sei. Tá? Sim, aí são duas perguntas muito interessantes. Eu acho que eu vou ficar mais tempo respondendo a segunda, porque é uma coisa que a gente está trabalhando agora. Enquanto a primeira, é certo. Ou, na verdade, é uma das, das coisas mais... Uh... É mais, um, não, não, que não é ruim nem é fraco, mas uma das debilidades desse approach é muito físico a estudar esses padrões é precisamente coisas, é, detalhes como os que você levantou, né? Por exemplo, eles não consideram o vento, pode ser uma região, o vento é muito importante para os processos da, da planta, é como esses processos escalam a escalas maiores, é, a gente não sabe, é, a gente não está considerando nos modelos, né? Porque por muito tempo, as pessoas ficaram interessadas em reproduzir o padrão. E se o modelo reproduzia o padrão, que era muito bonitinho e que é um fenômeno emergente, então a gente já ficava satisfeita. Eu usava esses padrões para fazer, para trazer hipóteses mais ecológicas. Né? Mas o ponto chave é que pode ser que com o vento o padrão seja o mesmo, pode ser ou pode não ser, mas pode ser que o vento esteja, esteja jogando um papel muito importante na, na, na dinâmica ecológica, então o padrão não tem mais o mesmo significado e você tem que colocar o vento no seu no seu modelo, por exemplo. É um, um, uma das questões. Tem outros ingredientes, por exemplo, eu falei a, a pendente do, do terreno, não? E ela é muito importante tanto para o padrão, para, para, para o padrão porque ela quebra a simetria do, do, do landscape, como para as consequências ecológicas dele. Então, Sim, todos eles podem jogar em ter uma influência, mas a gente não sabe porque não estudou. Essa é a resposta mais honesta. A segunda pergunta, ela é, é para mim, eu sempre digo, é a melhor pergunta, mas é uma pergunta muito, 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 muito boa, muito, muito interessante. É, é certo que tem plantas que elas podem é, interagir de formas diferentes? É, além disso, mesmo a plantas que tem, por exemplo, esses experimentos que eu mostrei, a gente fez com, com pementos que eles eram é, selvagens, eles eram wild type. Né? Então, é, se você, por exemplo, repetir esse é, experimento com pementos que eles levam muito tempo é, sendo cultivados pelo ser humano, né? se, sendo domesticados, você pode esperar um comportamento totalmente diferente por, 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 por o ponto que eu falei sobre melhorar os cultivos, né? mesmo sem a gente, sem os, os agricultores saber que eles estavam mudando a resposta da raiz de um lado para outro, mas observando que de, com, com um desenho diferente dos seus cultivos, eles aumentavam a produção dos seus cultivos, eles foram selecionando por eh, plantas que elas eram mais cooperativas, porque as cooperativas produzem mais, mais fruto. Então, uma hipótese que a gente tem, que tentou testar no experimento, mas não, o experimento ficou muito... Não, não deu certo, não, não funcionou. Não é que não apoiar a hipótese, é que o experimento quebrou. É precisamente isso. Se nós repetimos esse mesmo experimento com uma variedade cultivada de, de, de pimento, é possível que a gente ache um comportamento mais cooperativo porque o ser humano é, é, impulsa, não, colocou uma força seletiva externa forte hacia esse comportamento. 
aí, se a gente achar esse resultado, aí daria para trazer conclusões muito mais fortes. E, por suposto, desde o extremo da hipótese 1 ao extremo da hipótese 2, tem um contínuo né, de, de soluções onde diferentes plantas podem ficar em diferentes lugares desse, desse cultivo. Aí também o último, o último ponto é que tem muitas plantas que elas, o que você falou, elas eh, pegam eh, substâncias químicas para o solo, para atacar outras plantas, para eh, produzir eh, substâncias que, que elas eh, tentam aproveitar. Aí é, as respostas nesses cenários, nesses cenários são muito diferentes. Né? Essa é uma das coisas que, que nós queremos estudar agora é que é o que acontece, por exemplo, se as plantas têm eh, eh, armas não é armas químicas, mas tem essa possibilidade de secretar substâncias químicas que as outras plantas podem sentir, podem retrair ou podem tentar responder a elas. É, interações muito mais complexas. Né? A que a gente estudou aqui é a mais simples de todas. Obrigada. Obrigado a eu, Carla. <risos> Boa sorte. Obrigado. Mais perguntas? Ele teve um destaque no boletim da SBF, né? E lá tem um filminho, então quem quiser olhar, eu, eu vi quando logo que saiu o destaque. É, aqui você optou por colocar os gráficos, né, Ricardo? Mas o, não lembro o que, que tem de resultado lá. Dá para ver mais do experimento no, no filminho? Aí no. Eu acho no... que o filminho não era da SBF, né? É A SBF tem um vídeo seu, mas aí acho que tinha um link para um filme que eu não sei se foi feito pro, pelo pessoal da Espanha ou pelo. Pela Isso, revista? Da revista. Eles fizeram, na verdade, com eles têm muito mais recursos, eles sabem muito melhor, eles fizeram mesmo animação de como as... Eles estão no YouTube, eu vou esquecer de colocar o link, mas é, eles mostram como é que as raízes vão crescendo e como elas vão é, indo para trás, mas é uma animação com computador, não é, não é com os experimentos. Tá. Ô, Carol, pode fazer uma pergunta? Pode, claro. Aqui, aqui é o Lucas, Lucas Vardil. Cara, é fascinante ver esses, esses, esses seminários, porque que nem eu, eu trabalho com, essas, né, com essa área de teoria de jogos, de âmbito evolutivo, ecologia, mas assim, bem do ponto de vista teórico, sabe, simulacional. E quando você vê essa pegada quantitativa, né, você vê realmente, assim, estimula a gente a, né, a continuar e tentar, né, cada vez se aproximar mais. Eu achei muito legal, cara. É, só uma, uma, uma coisinha, uma dúvida aqui, a questão. É, faz sentido nesse modelo de raízes, pensar, vamos dizer assim, uma heterogeneidade de, de, de recursos assim, no solo, como se algum terreno fosse mais assim atrativo do que outro. Isso é algo que faz sentido? Sim, faz, faz muito sentido. É uma das coisas que nós fizemos aqui, no é, fizemos nesse artigo daqui, mas fizemos de uma forma muito, muito simples, para estudar como é que... Se você tem uma, uma parte do solo que tem muitos recursos, como é que as raízes vão para ele, tem aí como um campo de batalha muito forte, e como isso afeta as raízes em outro lugar, e, e faz tudo sentido. Uma das coisas, nós fizemos de uma maneira muito simples aí, só colocando uma distribuição a, externa de recursos no espaço, em lugar de deixar ela evoluir é, com a dinâmica das plantas, colocamos, impusimos isso. E é, é pode estudar coisas dessas, tipo, é, se aí tem um lugar que por algum motivo tem muito, muito recurso, mas fica muito longe de uma planta, é muito perto da outra, como é que, ela, a, que a, a planta que está longe vai tentar ir lá ou vai tentar... É, foi uma das coisas que, que estudamos e que achamos nesse cenário muito simples, é precisamente isso, que se tem um, um hotspot né, de recursos num lugar do, do solo, as, raízes, as plantas mesmo, se elas estão muito longe desse, desse lugar, elas vão tentar ir, ir para lá. Mas a resposta da planta que fica mais perto vai ser muito mais agressiva. Então, é, às vezes, o sucesso da planta de longe não é, seria maior se ela não for para lá, mas termina aí, felizmente. Ah, não. Também já me chamou a atenção para ler, inclusive, esse segundo artigo aí. Né? Sim, esse daí tem muita... Para mim... Levanta muitas questões que, que nós estamos estudando e outras que aí tem algum resultado preliminar, mas é, é, é bem, não sei, não vou falar que eu gosto mais do, do que outro, porque eu gosto muito dos dois, mas é, acho que é bem interessante mesmo. Não, tá certo. Obrigado. Obrigado, eu. Mais alguma pergunta, comentário? Podem levantar a mão. Não? Não? Então, a gente agradece mais uma vez o Ricardo. Eu achei muito legal, muito interessante. Obrigada.
Muito obrigado, Carlos. Eu agradeço o convite. Vou parar a gravação aqui.